There are few horror comedies that are as perfect as Young Frankenstein. Frankenstein. The movie actually began as an idea that Gene Wilder had, and it was him who talked Mel Brooks into directing it, and the two then collaborated on the script. It's a full-blown classic, no doubt about it. But just over a decade later, Gene Wilder would write, direct, and star in another lesser-known horror comedy, Haunted Honeymoon, an almost cult classic. Now, while Gene Wilder will always be remembered for his iconic film performances, a lot of movie fans seem to overlook Gene Wilder's career as a director. He directed five films in total, The Adventure of Sherlock Holmes's Smarter Brother, The World's Greatest Lover, a segment in the anthology film Sunday Lovers, The Woman in Red, and finally, Haunted Honeymoon. <laughs> The Woman in Red marked a major turning point in Gene's career. It was a modest box office success for the studio, Orion Pictures, and proved that Gene Wilder could still headline a romantic comedy movie at over 50 years old. I just got the latest figures from Community Affairs. The cable car campaign is a smash. It's better than our wildest imagination. We couldn't have hoped for a better campaign than what we've got right now. And it's due to you, sir. It also proved that he and his then-wife, Gilda Radner, still had amazing chemistry on screen after previously starring in Hanky Panky, the film which they met on. As such, the studio was quick to give him carte blanche on his next film, Haunted Honeymoon. Larry! Don't move. You're risking your lives. Don't even raise your voices. There's a deadly snake in that closet. Call the zoo! Now, I'll be the first to admit there are certain elements of this movie that don't quite come together as well as Gene Wilder probably planned. As much as I enjoy this movie for what it is, the story can be a little muddled at times. Still, it's a really fun, inventive movie, with a lot of terrific performances and set pieces. The idea for A Haunted Honeymoon came about from Gene's love of the old comedy mysteries. Here's a segment from his autobiography about finding inspiration to write this movie. When I was a kid, I loved comedy mysteries, especially Bob Hope in The Cat and the Canary and Ghostbreakers. The movie idea I had was to make my own comedy horror film, but using the same techniques for visual effects that they used in the 1930s, where every visual effect was done in the camera, not at some visual effects plant. And Gene was pretty true to his word. Most of the effects in this movie are all practical, made through simple camera tricks. I think it's part of the reason the movie didn't resonate with 80s horror fans. In the era of immersive special effects like that of the Nightmare on Elm Street series, the effects here could be considered dated. But I actually love them. It adds a charm to the movie that seems to be exactly what Gene Wilder was going for. When designing the look of the film, Gene chose not to use any bright primary colors, as he wanted the movie to feel like those old black and white movies, but still be in color. He also requested the movie to be lit softly, resulting in a really dark, interesting visual style. These elements combine to give the movie a really unique look that I haven't really seen in a movie since. Gene referred to the film as a comedy chiller, and it's a mood I feel he achieves perfectly. Mr. Rabbit. What a beautiful night, isn't it? Isn't it romantic? Drifting shadows write the oldest magic word. Oh, to be dancing with the woman you love. The plot, like so many of those black and white comedy mysteries, centers around a radio broadcast, Manhattan Mystery Theater. In particular, the stars, Larry Abbott and his fiancée Vicky Pearl, played by Jean and Gilda. As I said earlier, they met on the set of Hanky Panky, which was originally intended to be a movie for Gene Wilder and Richard Pryor. Who are you? What difference does it make? Just take the money and leave me alone. I don't want your money. I don't want your body either. They quickly fell in love and were married in 1984. As with The Woman in Red, they're a lot of fun together as a team. Their real-life chemistry transcends into their screen characters. You can see the love, joy, and humor between them in every one of their scenes together. I know he seems a little strange, but he's perfectly normal. 
Well, what'll I talk about? We'll talk about a minute. That'll be enough. The story takes place in the 1930s. Larry, who has recently proposed to Vicky, is suffering from panic attacks on air as a result. Cheers! To Wolfington Castle! To woo 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 woo! To woo 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 To woo 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 woo! The broadcast studio, not wanting to have to give up their star performer, brings in Larry's cousin, the Orson Welles esque Dr. Paul Abbott, played by Paul Smith. He's a prominent doctor who has a plan to cure Larry with some new shock therapy. I, Paul Abbott, promise that I can cure Larry within 36 hours. Just by scaring him. By scaring him to death. As Larry and Vicky will soon be traveling to the castle he grew up in for their wedding, Dr. Abbott views this as the perfect opportunity to enact his plan. Oh my God, you want to scare him more than he already is? How do you cure hiccups, Mr. Tarlow? Joining Larry and Vicky for their pre-wedding festivities, are Larry's eccentric family, and cousins. One of whom, Charles, is played by Jonathan Price, who is now dating an ex-girlfriend of Larry's. Say, has Larry been flirting with you? Oh, Charlie. Charlie, I'm engaged Larry, to you want to back what? Charlie! I've got Charlie. my own girl, Charlie. Oh. It's like the old days, huh, cuz? And then, of course, there's Larry's great Aunt Catherine, played by Dom DeLuise. Oh. Oh. Hello, darling. And Kate? This is my fiance, Vicky. How do you oh, do, Aunt Kate? Oh, charming, charming. I'm starved. Let's eat. I guess this is one of those elements that baffled a lot of critics and the audience at the time, but honestly, it kind of works. I sometimes forget I'm watching Dom DeLuise because he's just that good as an elderly woman. One of you is preying upon the fears of an old woman. Whoever you are, may God strike you dead. Now let's have coffee and dessert in the music room. Here's another clip from Gene's audiobook that sums up why he cast Dom in this part. One evening, Dom DeLuise came to my house for dinner and did his imitation of Ethel Barrymore, which made me laugh so much because it was funny, of course, but also because it was so accurate. I asked Dom if he would play my aunt doing his Ethel Barrymore if I ever made a 1930s comedy horror film. He said he would. You step around the floor, kind of nice and light. But soon after their arrival, Larry begins experiencing a series of bizarre events that leaves us, as the audience, wondering whether it's all an elaborate ruse to scare him or if there's something more sinister going on here. As Larry experiences more than a few jump scares, complete with spectral visions, dead bodies, and even a werewolf. And even though it gets a little hard to follow, there's still some great comedy sequences throughout. You mean the radio actor? Yeah, that's me. I'm just going over my lines. Murderer! There's a lot of the type of quick wordplay that Gene displayed in Young Frankenstein. There are only three like it in the entire world. Oh, what kind is it? 25 past 7. As well as his gift for simply reacting to the situations around him. I've made a whole video profiling Gene's incredible reactions, but they're really prevalent in this movie. And in watching this, you can't help but see what an effective comedic actor he could be. Forget your troubles, come on, get happy. We're gonna chase all your blues away. Boo! Boo! Shout hallelujah! Come on, get happy, get... E -e 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 -red. Gilda is also just great, and some of the biggest laughs come from her performance. We were just talking about you. Honey, this is Rachel. How do you do? As ye sow, so shall ye reap. The movie also never stops being inventive in its practical effects and cinematography. But despite all of this, the movie was a huge box office flop, and pretty reviled by critics. Oh, I woo! I woo! I woo, um... Yes. I'll have some. <laughs> Dom DeLuise earned that year's Razzie for Worst Supporting Actress. Blasphemous men with their painted women. They reveled in the joys of fleshly love. Oh... 
Sadly, its failure caused it to be Gene's last time in the director's chair, and one of his final roles before his screen retirement. Even more sadly, it also marked the last time Gilda Radner would appear in a movie, as she was diagnosed with ovarian cancer shortly after production wrapped. This is all the more heartbreaking, considering how much fun it looked like to be involved in this movie, and how much of himself Gene put into the movie. I loved these kinds of films when I was a little boy, and was scared by them. They were called comedy chillers. That is, they scared you, but you also laughed. And the tricky part is the balance of the comedy and the scary stuff. It's not without its problems, but it in no way justifies the hate it received from critics. It may not hold a candle to Young Frankenstein, but it's still a visually impressive, fun movie that's worth a watch. Oh, oh, oh. Oh. <laughs> it's frightening. <laughs>